Let's pray together. Our gracious Father, thank you for saving us from eternal hell and making us your children. Because of your love and grace, now we have a peace in our heart. And we know you are always watching over us every day, every moment, trying to help us and guide us and lead us. And today we are here again to listen to your word so that we can learn many lessons for our Christian life. So Lord, open our ears and open our heart so that we can listen carefully and we can obey your word in our life. Lord, we want to grow and we want to work for you, but we know you are using the clean vessel for your ministry. So make us clean and help us to grow so that we can be used in this harvest time for your glory. From the beginning to the end, I commit the rest of time unto your mighty hand. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, let's open the Bible. Um, Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1 to 3. Uh, Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1 to 3. Isaiah in the Old Testament, uh, chapter 6, verses 1 to 3. Three verses. Okay, let's read them together. In the year that King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphim, each one had six wings, with the two he covered his face, with the two he covered his feet, and with the two he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Uh, I had a chance to visit uh, Seattle Church and Vancouver Church last week. And I had a blessed time with the brothers and sisters of both churches. And I really thank God for giving me a chance to meet uh, the brothers and sisters all over the world. And wherever I go, I find them, they have a heart to glorify God and to work for God. And they have a heart, they want to grow more and more. So uh, I really thank uh, all the brothers and sisters of Seattle Church and Vancouver Church for their uh, warm hospitality. And um, even though, you know, we cannot see each other face to face, um, but we can have fellowship through this um, YouTube and Kakao Talk. So I want to hear from you also, and we want to pray for you so that we can grow together. Today, um, the title of uh, today's Bible study is Lessons from Seraphim. Lessons from Seraphim. And we'll see how to serve the Lord from this scene in Isaiah chapter 6, especially uh, from the way the seraphim is. So, in the year that King Isaiah died, I saw, who is I? Isaiah, the prophet, right? He saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. So Isaiah had a chance to see the Lord, the glory of the Lord, if, if I can say exactly, because uh, nobody can see God and live, right? So Moses, he saw the backside of the Lord, but actually, what he saw was um, God's glory. I mean, God appeared in a way that we can see, but that is because God is spirit, uh, as a, you know, as a human, we cannot really see God uh, in his actual form. Here so, Isaiah one day, uh, he saw God in his glory, and actually in verse 8, this is um, a very famous verse, um, in verse 8, uh, chapter 6, verse 8, let me read, And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom uh, shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? 
God always is looking for his worker. You know. He needs someone to go and work for him. Preach the message of God or lead the people. You know. So here, I just said, here am I, send me. I saw one t-shirt, right? Uh, some brothers and sisters were wearing t-shirts with, here am I, send me. That's beautiful. Because we have a heart to serve the Lord all the time, right? And that's how uh, Isaiah began his ministry. And here in verse 2, uh, verse 2, above is stood seraphim. Seraphim is a kind of angel. Uh, and this word, the seraphim, appears only in this chapter in the whole Bible. You cannot find it any, uh, anywhere else, actually. Seraphim. Um, so this seraphim is, um, I think, it's some special kind of the angel, right? So above it to the seraphim, each one had six wings. With two he covered his face. With two he covered his feet. And with two he flew. And one cried to another and said, "Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory." This seraphim had uh, six wings, and I think uh, we have something similar. In Revelation, let's uh, bookmark here and let's go to uh, Revelation chapter 4. Then again, John the Apostle saw four living creatures before the throne and they have six wings too. So, uh, Revelation chapter 4, verse 6. Revelation, the last book, uh, chapter 4, verse 6. Let me read from verse 6. Uh, before the throne, there was a sea of glass like a crystal and in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back the first living creature was like a lion the second living creature like a calf the third living creature like a face like a man and the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle verse 8 let's read it together the four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within, and they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. So you see, these four living creatures uh, have some similarity with this um, seraphim we just saw in Isaiah chapter 6, because they have uh, six wings, and then they are giving praise to the Lord, saying, Holy, holy, holy. By the way, holy, holy, holy means uh, Trinity God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. Uh, they are singing praise to these three persons, but in one God, uh, Trinity God. So, uh, of course, I think you remember in verse 7, these four living creatures. The first one is like a lion. The second one is like a, a calf. And the third one is like a man. The fourth is like a eagle. These, corresponding, these are corresponding to four Gospels. Right? Matthew describes Jesus as a king. Lion is a king of animal. And um, uh, Mark is, uh, in Mark, Jesus is a servant. So here, a calf. And in Luke, we see the humanity, humanity of Jesus. Jesus is a human being. So here, a man. And uh, in John, the Gospel of John, Jesus is God, actually, God himself. And this um, flying eagle represents the um, divinity of Jesus. So these four living creatures are corresponding to the four Gospels we have in the New Testament. So we don't know exactly whether these are also seraphims, but we see some similarities. Uh, they have the six wings and they are singing praises to the Lord, saying, Holy, Holy, Holy. So let's go back to Isaiah chapter 6. Uh, verse 2. You see, these uh, special kind of angels, uh, seraphim, they are right before the throne of the Lord, serving the Lord. Now we know from the scripture, God created the angels as a servant. We, we were created as a loving partner. God loves us. No, we, are, uh, we are loved by God, actually. But angels are workers, ministers to God. And because this seraphim, especially in Isaiah chapter 6, they are right in front of the throne of God and they are serving the Lord all the time, 
Today we learn some lessons from Seraphim regarding how we can serve the Lord. In what way, right? Suppose, you know, after being born again, we love God. And somehow we want to pay back the love of God, the grace of God we received in the time of salvation. Then the question is, how can we serve the Lord? Because even serving the Lord should be done in God's way. Many Christians make a mistake, right? They have their own ways of serving God without knowing God's will. Then maybe, you know, they work very hard, they sacrifice, however, when they go to heaven, there might be nothing. Do you remember in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, right? Um, without love, if you sacrifice and do something for the Lord, they are, we are nothing, right? Even if you give your whole life, or even if you have faith, you know, so strong, or even if uh, all these things you do for the Lord, if it's not done according to God's will, they count nothing. That's why we have to learn how to serve the Lord from this seraphim. So let's see the first thing in verse 2. Above it to the seraphim, each one had six wings. With the two he covered his face, with the two he covered his feet, and with the two he flew. First, we learn, um, you know, we learn from the seraphim how to serve the Lord. First of all, uh, seraphim, they had uh, six wings. And uh, with the two wings, they covered their face. They covered their face. And with the two wings, they covered their feet. And another two wings, they are flying. What, what, do they, what does it mean, right? So let's think about it. First of all, with two wings, they cover their face. That means humility. You know, we have to humble ourselves when you want to serve the Lord. Do you know, a long time ago, the people could not even make uh, eye contact with the king. When king comes, I saw, I think I saw in the, one of the movie or drama, people all bow down with their feet, with their face down. How can, how can they, you know, look at the king in his eyes? No way. You are not supposed to make eye contact with the king. You are not supposed to watch him actually. You, know? you are not worthy. So here, this seraphim, with two wings, they cover their face. We are not worthy to, to look at you, Lord. This is um, humility and humbleness. God uses the humble. Right? Jesus became so lowly in this world when he came in human body. He showed the example of humility. Actually. Right? Are you humble? Humble people. God loves humble people and God is with them and God uses them. God achieves great things through humble people. The pride is our enemy. Remember, God cannot use the proud. So let's bookmark here. We'll come back here and then let's go to the Revelation chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4. All these people and all the creatures, they bow down before God and humble themselves, right? Uh, Revelation chapter 4, verse 10 and 12. Uh, 10 and 11. There's no 12, sorry. 10 and 11. Revelation chapter 4, verse 10 and 11. Let's read it together. The 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever, and cast their crowns before the Lord throne, saying, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. Listen, 
these 24 elders represent all the saints from the Old Testament and New Testament. Right? 12 from the Old Testament and 12 from the New Testament. So they represent the whole the saint, all the saint, all children of God. And let's see what they are doing. They fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. This shows what we will do in heaven actually. We will worship God forever and ever with angels singing. You know. And they cast their crowns before the throne. They cast their crowns. Of course we receive crowns of uh, glory, crowns of life, all kinds of crown, crowns for uh, whatever we have done for the Lord. But actually we will cast all the crowns. Why? Verse 11. You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things and by your will they exist and were created. We we'll realize one thing. God is the one who created us. God is the one who saved us. And God is the one who helped us so that we can work for the Lord. We can live for the Lord, actually. If there's anything we could do for the Lord, it is because of God, actually. God made it possible. You know, without God, without His uh, power and without His uh, strength or, or without His wisdom, no, we cannot even live even one moment. You know, the true humbleness is uh, knowing who you are, truly. Jesus, our Lord, is the King of kings, Lord of lords, right? He is worthy to be worshipped. Uh, in King James Version, the last part of verse 11 is translated this way. Verse 11, the last part of the uh, verse 11. For thy pleasures, they are and were created. This is the purpose of our life. Thy pleasure, to please Him, to worship Him, to please Him. This is why we are living in this world after salvation. The whole creature should praise Him and worship Him and glorify Him. No. And that happens only when we humble ourselves. Do you really treat Jesus as the king in your life? Uh, Revelation chapter 5 verse 11 and thir 11 to 13. Revelation chapter 11, uh, 5 verse 11 to 13. Let's read it together. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne and living creatures and the elders, and the number of them were, was 10,000 times 10,000, and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom, and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth, and such as are in the sea, and all that are in them, I heard, saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. The Lamb who was slain. Lamb. That shows how lowly Jesus became for us, right? Lamb. And he was slain. He died for us. He gave everything for us. And he became so lowly. And he took all our sins. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's how we can go to heaven, right? And we should be humble. God uses the humble people. And when Jesus was in this world, he was so humble. We have to learn from Jesus, right? Let's turn to Matthew chapter 11. Uh, Gospel of Matthew chapter 11. Verse 29. Matthew chapter 11, verse 29. Matthew uh, chapter 11, verse 29. Let's read it together. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Jesus said, I am gentle, very kind, and lowly in heart. 
Do you remember how Jesus entered Jerusalem? You know, people were saying, Hosanna, Hosanna. But actually, Jesus was riding on a donkey. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21, verse 5. Matthew chapter 21, verse 5. Matthew chapter 21 verse 5. Let's read it together. Tell the daughters of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt, the uh, fowl of a donkey. What does that mean? King. Here, look at this. Behold, your king is coming. King is riding a horse usually, right? The best horse. A horse, if you ride a horse, you cannot approach him. Donkey on the other way, no. It's a smaller and gentler, even the children. Especially, uh, Jesus was riding a colt of a donkey, the baby donkey. Why? Even the children could come to Jesus. Oh, Jesus, Jesus. You know, maybe they touched Jesus' clothes. Or they were touching his hand, Jesus. Even the children could come. If, if Jesus was riding a horse, you know, who can approach Jesus, right? And there's one thing you have to think about. This donkey, suppose, just imagine. This donkey saw people, people shouting and praising Jesus. And this donkey thought people were praising himself, the him, the donkey. So what if the donkey you know, tried to get off and then take all these um, Hosanna and you know, all these uh, glory. So Donkey was going like this, but suddenly he saw the people were you know, shouting and the donkey said, Oh, okay, okay, like this. What would happen to Jesus on his back? Jesus would fall down. And that's what happens sometimes with us, right? Now we do some small thing and try to take all this glory and credit. And that's when we make this the same mistake as this donkey trying to get up, taking all this glory. Jesus will be, you know, not not riding the donkey anymore because uh, he's trying to take all this credit. So, verse seven, they brought the donkey and the colt, laid their clothes on them, and set him on them. Actually, Jesus was riding a colt, the baby one. Why? Because he was so humble. Who fears God? Those who are humble, those, they are the one who fear God. Okay? Who are humble? Those who listen to the word of God. Those who try to correct themselves. You know, as a pastor, sometimes I do the counseling, but some brothers and sisters, they never listen. They say whatever they think is right. I'm not saying pastors are always right. I saw pastors make mistakes. However, the reason why we listen to the pastors or the leaders in the church is because of their position, actually. Okay. Let's go to uh, Proverbs chapter 22, verse 4. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 4. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 4. Uh, Let's read it together. By humility... And the fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. Humility and the fear of the Lord are connected. Connected. Why? Let's think about it. If you are really humble, then you know who you are. And who, who are you? Without God, we cannot even live one moment. That's true. God is sustaining our lives. God is providing everything. My heart is beating, pounding. Why? Because of God, actually, right? We have a food to eat. Why? Because God provides food for us. Everything comes from God. Actually. Do you see the puppet or with the string attached puppet? You know. The puppet is controlled by the string, and if the strings are all cut, the puppet will fall down and cannot move. We are just like that. Be humble. God 
love the humble people and God uses those who are humble. Let's turn to Isaiah chapter 57. Isaiah chapter 57 verse 15. Isaiah chapter 57 verse 15. Isaiah uh, chapter 57 verse 14, uh, 15. Let's read it together. For thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him who has a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. What is the contrite ones? Those who repent. Repent. And those who are humble. Those who are lowly. They are the ones who are with God. And those are the ones God uses for His ministry. Remember, be humble. Be humble. Listen and obey. Be humble. Sometimes in the church, you know, they make a decision, the leaders make a decision which you do not understand, but still, be humble. Of course, uh, you can make uh, some suggestion, no problem, but uh, in a humble way, pastor or uh, the leader of the father's group, mother's group, you approach them and say, oh, in my opinion, isn't it better, but uh, in my humble opinion, just, you know, know your position, actually. Okay? The church, in the church there's an order, okay? Uh, there are brothers who are responsible, who will uh, be accountable before God, actually, okay? So, we should be humble. Peter, according to Jesus' commandment, he uh, through the net and then he caught a lot of fish and he came to know that Jesus is God actually and when he realized Jesus is God this is what he said let's turn to Luke chapter 5 verse 8 Luke chapter 5 verse 8 Luke chapter 5 verse 8 Let's read it together. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. When Peter saw the great work of Jesus, because when he obeyed Jesus, he caught so many fish. Actually, he couldn't catch even a single one the whole night. But now he knew who Jesus was, and he said, Depart from me, for I am sinful man, O Lord. Who are we before God? Nothing. No. When God takes the breath away from us, we die. We praise God. We thank God. We glorify God. And if you are humble, you will be in the church all the time. You will join the fellowship all the time. Because if you are humble, you know your position. Uh, I know my position. I'm a pastor. But I know if I don't attend the fellowship, I'm powerless. I don't grow up alone. When I'm a part of the body of Christ, the church, when I am connected to the body, I'm just uh, one single part. You know? So, if you are really humble, you will join the fellowship. If you are not humble, if you think like that, oh, I don't have to go to the church or I, I don't have to join fellowship, I'm okay. That's pride, actually. We need God's power and wisdom and strength for our Christian life. Secondly, secondly, this uh, let's go back to Isaiah chapter six, verse two. Above is to the seraphim. Each one had six wings. With the two he covered his face. With the two he covered his feet. His feet. What does that mean? Why he covered his feet? Do you remember in John chapter 13, Jesus washed the feet of the disciples? And why? Because with the salvation, our whole body is clean. That's what Jesus said to Peter. Let, let's turn to John chapter 13. John chapter 13. 
John chapter 13, verse Um, John chapter uh, 13, verse 9 and 10. 9 and 10. Uh, John, Gospel of John 13, verse 9 and 10. Let's read it together. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, He who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. But you are clean, but not all of you. So here, Jesus was washing the feet of the disciples. And uh, when Peter saw Jesus doing that, he said, Not, not just uh, my feet only, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus said, Who he is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. With the salvation, you have become clean. Don't worry. That's why we can go to heaven. But the problem with the feet is, feet, it touches the, uh, the earth all the time. Uh, in Israel, Israel is very dusty. So when you go out and come back, you know, your feet become very dirty, actually. So you have to wash. So usually, they, uh, if you are invited to some uh, place, the servant comes with uh, water and wash your feet. That's what Jesus was doing, actually, washing the feet like a servant. So he was showing the example uh, of our servantship. A servanthood. Uh, but anyway, listen. To serve the Lord, your heart should be pure and you should cleanse yourself, actually. Of course, we are clean. That's what Jesus said. Uh, he who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. In, in, before God, we are completely clean, of course, legally and in our position. We are righteous. However, while we are living in this world, slowly, slowly we are influenced by the world and then our heart, you know, some darkness is there. So we have to cleanse ourselves all the time. This, this has nothing to do with uh, going to heaven, by the way. This is how to, uh, you know, the, there are three stages of salvation. The first one is justification. Second one is uh, sanctification. The third one is uh, glorification. Right. So this second stage, sanctification. Even though we are righteous before God, actually in our life, still we have this sinful nature and we have to cleanse ourselves. And that's why Jesus washed their feet. Without washing uh, our feet, we cannot work. For the Lord. We cannot serve the Lord. So, we have to wash our feet. How? Through the fellowship, through the word of God, we have to cleanse ourselves. The problem of those who are not saved yet, uh, like um, churchgoers or these uh, Sunday Christian, those who have no assurance of salvation but they uh, think they are children of God, their problem is this. Their body is still dirty. Their head is dirty. Their body is dirty. But they try to live a good life. They try to do good work. That is like a, with a dirty body. They just try to wash their feet only. Their body is smelly and uh, stinky and dirty. They cannot enter heaven in that body. But they have no idea about their spiritual condition. Unless one is born again, he cannot enter. He cannot see the kingdom of God, actually. right? So we are clean. When we believe the power of the blood of Jesus Christ, and when we know Jesus died for my past sin, present sin, even future sins, we are clean now. But we have to wash our feet all the time because God uses those or who have a pure heart. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, verse 8. Matthew chapter 5, verse 8. Matthew chapter 5, verse 8. Let's read it together. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the pure in heart. Even after salvation, some brothers and sisters, they still follow their own 
uh, like uh, their, their lifestyle from the past. Their heart is not pure. Of course they trust Jesus, but it takes time. It takes time to become like a Jesus. And the, the quicker uh, we leave everything in our past behind, and then we really uh, follow the uh, footsteps of Jesus, the better. So, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. After Noah came out of this uh, ark, after the flood, he offered sacrifice to the Lord. The clean animals, because God only receives clean animals as a sacrifice. Remember, if your heart is not pure, suppose, no matter how much money you give to, you offer to God, God would not accept, actually. You think, you know. So one time Jesus said, if you, if you, you know, um, have hate some brother, then first forgive him first and then offer sacrifice to God because God will not accept your offering if your heart, if your heart is not right. right. So let's turn to Genesis chapter 8. Genesis chapter 8, verse 20. Genesis chapter 8, verse 20. Genesis chapter 8, verse 20. Let's read it together. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took of every clean animal and of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. So here, you see, every clean animal and every clean bird was offered to God and God took it. No unclean animals. Even the Levites, before they served the Lord in the tabernacle, they cleansed themselves. They were not supposed to touch the dead body because the dead body represents the world. Whatever people do, the, those who are not born again, the worldly people, the unsaved people, unregenerate people, whatever they do are uh, like a, a, the dead body actually. Whatever they do are dead. Right? So let's turn to Numbers chapter 8. Numbers chapter 8. Verse 6 and 7. Numbers chapter 8, verse 6 and 7. Let's read it together. Take the Levites from among the children of Israel and cleanse them ceremonially. Thus you shall do to them to cleanse them. Sprinkle water of purification on them and let them shave all their body and let them wash their clothes and so make themselves clean. This is what happened in one of the church I heard. No. In the church, there was some sin, sinful act going on secretly. Some kind of the sexual sins, like uh, some brother and sister were having an affair. Surprising thing is, the other brother and sister, they didn't know, but no matter how much they tried to preach the gospel, and no matter how many times they have the Bible seminar, no one gets saved. No one gets saved. No one got saved. Later, the pastor came to know what was going on in the church. And then these, uh, the, that brother and sister who were having an affair, they were disciplined. And they, uh, usually the discipline is they couldn't attend the church service for six months or one year. That's what we do. Of course, they, will, they can listen to the sermon at home. They should, by the way. It's not like, a, you know, because uh, they are the bad influence of the church, they need some time of repentance. But they should listen to the word of God more, actually. But anyway... When they removed those, uh, you know, that unclean brother and sister from the church from that time on, church grew. Do not try to deceive the Lord. God is not mocked. God is not deceived. Individually or even in the church, if there's uh, some sinful act going on, God cannot use you. Or even the church, okay? Because God knows what's going on. Uh, Numbers chapter 19, Numbers chapter 19, verse 11. Numbers chapter 19, verse 11. Let's read it together. 
He who touches the dead body of anyone shall be unclean seven days. The dead body is is, uh, unclean actually. It makes you unclean. Uh, Do not take worldly things into the church. Some brother and sister, they want to talk about the political issues in the church. Don't do that. Of course, we have to pray for the leaders of the nation so that we can have a peaceful time and we can preach the gospel without difficulty. That is one thing. But we do not discuss the political things in the church that divide the church. And do not take these worldly things like uh, worldly entertainment or sports or whatever which is not uh, from God into the church. Okay? We are the holy people. We are the holy people. And whatever the people do in the world are death work. Okay? Verse 13. Whoever touches the body of anyone who has died and does not purify himself, defiles the tabernacle of the Lord. That person shall be cut off from Israel. He shall be unclean because the water of purification was not sprinkled on him. His uncleanness is still on him. We had uh, one Bible study about clean and unclean animals, right? God uses clean vessel, clean people. You have to ask yourself, are you clean or not? Especially, we know Jesus will come very soon and we will be standing before him for the judgment seat of Christ. Do you remember? Whatever you have done after salvation, before salvation it doesn't matter. But whatever you have done after salvation will be judged by Jesus. And that's why we try to keep ourselves clean. Let's turn to 1 John chapter 3, verse 3. Uh, 1 John chapter 3, verse 3. 1 John chapter 3, verse 3. Let's, let's read it together. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself, just as he is pure. What hope? What hope? Hope of seeing Jesus face to face when he comes again. So whoever has this hope in him purify himself. Like, you know, we will be the bride and Jesus will be our bridegroom. So when you are waiting for your wedding ceremony, you try to keep yourself clean. Actually, right? This world is very sinful. And um, I see something very deserving these days. As you know, Second Corinthians chapter six says we are not Christians are not to marry unchrist, uh, non-Christians. Believers are not to marry unbelievers. That is the the word of God. But sometimes I see, uh, you know, some brother sister marry unbelievers, and uh, I'm worried that. If young brothers and sisters, those are single ones, if they think that, oh, look at them. They are marrying unbelievers. You know, it's a serious matter, actually. Um, some brother and sister says, oh, even though they are not born again, they, I love them. I love him or I love her. And then they promise to come to church. And then how do you know that uh, you know, you know, I can evangelize them? Well, when you are disobeying God, why do you think God will bless you? And I saw so many brothers and sisters who was hoping that their spouse will become born again, but no way. They couldn't even come to the church for many years and they wasted so many years. Later they regret so much about not obeying the word of God. Anyway. The church should be holy. You know? The church is the salt and light of this world. Remember. So how can you cleanse our, uh, ourselves? Of course, you learn that when you attend the fellowship, like uh, John chapter 13, uh, we have to wash each other. What does that mean? 
during the fellowship you can confess your sins and then you can um, share your mistakes sometimes not the detail actually sometimes uh, if uh, when you share your sin or mistakes in too much detail that is not good but sometimes uh, sharing uh, some of your mistakes helps you to overcome it for example if you cannot quit smoking you can you can share like a Ah, I'm still smoking and I'm trying to quit smoking, but it's really hard. So please pray for me. And you know what happens? Whenever brother, sister, whenever brother, sister see you later, they will ask you, Oh, brother, have you quit smoking? Oh, not yet. I'm praying. Don't worry. Right? So when you hear that again and again, you will have the strength to quit smoking and drinking and whatever. Okay? So... Uh, when you share and confess your sins in the fellowship, it cleanses you. And another thing is, the Word of God cleanses you. The Word of God. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26. Let's read it together. That he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the Word. The word of God is like a water. So the word of God will wash you. You read the word of, word of God and that will cleanse your heart and turn your heart toward God again. Okay? So cleanse yourself before God. Just like the seraphim was covering their feet. And also let's go back to Isaiah chapter 6 verse 2. Uh, Above his two seraphim, each one had six wings. With two he covered his face, humility. With two he covered his feet, um, cleanness, uh, purity, right? And with two he flew. Just imagine, you know, before the throne of God, these uh, seraphim, they covered their face and feet and then with the rest of the wings they are flying like this right what does that mean they are right before the Lord flying means they are ready to do whatever God tells them you know, they are ready to uh, take action actually flying right always uh, moving their wings I told you that Mark in the gospel of Mark Mark represents Jesus as a servant. He became so low. So Matthew, in Matthew, Jesus is a king, but in Mark, Jesus is a servant. And one of the, um, the qualifications of the servant is uh, he should be quick to do whatever uh, he is uh, told to do, right? So let's turn to Mark. You'll see surprising. Uh, you'll see something very surprising that in Mark you'll find one word repeated again and again, and that word is immediately, immediately, right away. So Mark chapter one, uh, verse ten. Mark chapter one, verse ten. And immediately coming up from the water, he saw the heavens parting and the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. Verse twelve. Immediately the Spirit drove him into the wilderness. Right away, right? And also uh, verse 18, verse 18, They immediately left their net and followed him. The disciples immediately left their net and followed Jesus. Verse 20, And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with their higher servant, and went after him. Verse 21, Then they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath uh, he entered the synagogue and taught. Verse 28, And immediately his fame spread throughout all the region around Galilee. Verse 42, as soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. You see, this word immediately is repeated again and again. What does that mean? Jesus, as a servant, he took action right away, immediately. Suppose you have a servant and you tell him uh, what to do. And what kind of servant 
would you like to have? The one who is doing quickly or those who are lazy and they say, oh, later. Sir, I will do that tomorrow or later. Like that. You know, later or tomorrow is the, uh, the word, the favorite word of Satan. We preach the gospel and say, you should be born again. And they say, oh, later. I will, I will listen to the word. I will attend the Bible seminar later. I will listen to the word of God later. That's why Satan loves the word later. We, as a Christian, we should love this word immediately, right away. Right? No. Sometimes I'm working with uh, brothers and sisters, uh, for example, English team or some others, and then there are many things to do, actually. And then I love those brothers and sisters who take action right away, immediately. If you are uh, working in a company and uh, if you are a boss and if you are, have some subordinates uh, who are working for you, you love those who are doing things right away. Why? Because that shows that they have the heart you know, to, to, to do whatever you tell them to do. So, in our Christian life, Whatever we do for the Lord will remain forever. The others have no meaning, actually. It's meaningless. Let's turn to uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 2, because Ecclesiastes, you have to remember, whatever you do without God is meaningless. That is the theme of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 11. Ecclesiastes. Yeah. After Proverbs, Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 11. Let's read it together. Then I looked on all the works that my hands had done, and on the labor in which I had toiled, and indeed all was vanity and grasping for the wind. There was no profit under the sun. Whatever Solomon, King Solomon did, it was a vanity. It was nothing. It's like a grasping for the wind. No, you cannot grasp the wind. Whatever you do without God is a vanity. But whatever you do for the Lord will remain forever because Jesus promised that if you give a glass of water to the little one, Jesus will remember and reward you. So let's do. Let's work for the Lord when we have a chance. When it's a day. The night is coming. The night is coming. The seven year tribulation, you know that the seven year tribulation? The seven year of punishment for those who rejected Jesus until the last time. Now, it's the time of salvation. So, you know, let's work harder and harder. Because when night comes, there's no chance to work for the Lord. Um, in our church, Suwon Church, we are very busy. Almost every month we have a Bible seminar. Almost every month. And the uh, summer retreat time, we are all working hard to invite uh, our friends and relatives to the retreat center. And uh, many are born again. By the way, I see the brothers and sisters of Suwon Church are working very hard and diligently. The church is so active. It's a, it's a lively and now I know one thing. Sometimes we are tired and then we have our own work to do and uh, you know there are many things going on in our life. But whatever we do for the Lord will remain forever. And um, sometimes, for example, uh, you are a Sunday school teacher. You have a lot of work for teaching these children. And you might think, oh, it's too much. But when you go to heaven, you will thank God for giving you this opportunity to teach the children in the Sunday school teach as a Sunday school teacher because you know that only that work you did for the Lord, for God, is meaningful. And God re will reward you much, much more than what you deserve, actually. Right? But for King Solomon, whatever he did, in his life without God 
he finds it in a vanity. So let's work more and more for the Lord. Let's turn to First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58. I want you to remember this scripture. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58. Let's read it together. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Your labor, your work for the Lord is not in vain. The seraphim was, you know, flapping his wings so that he can do, go this way, this way, and then do whatever. God tells them to do. And finally, let's go back to Isaiah chapter 6, verse 3. Uh, and one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. Not only the seraphim was ready to uh, work for the Lord, serve the Lord, they were praising the Lord, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. This one we should also learn from seraphim. Because... Uh, God is so pleased with when we praise Him, actually. When we sing praises to Him. One day, I heard uh, one son was talking about his father. He said, I really, now I know how much my father loved me and sacrificed for me. I really respect my father. That is what every father wants to hear from his son, actually, right? Or daughter. So, God wants to listen to our praises, and that is our duty, actually. Okay, let's turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 19. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 19. Let's read it together. Speaking to, the, to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Yes, this is what you are supposed to do. That's why whenever we gather together, we are singing praises to Him. So speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. This is what uh, the early church Christians did. Whenever they gathered together, they were singing together. They, were, they had the spiritual songs and melody. And God is so pleased, so happy. And that's what we will do in heaven, actually. Glorifying God all the time. Do you remember um, David? David, right? He wrote many psalms. And not only he is a writer of the psalm, he was a really good singer. And he was a psalmist. He was praising God all the time in his psalms. Let's turn to 2 Samuel chapter 23. 2 Samuel Chapter 23, verse 1. 2 Samuel, chapter 23, verse 1. Let's read it together. Now these are the last words of David. Thus says David, the son of Jesse. Thus says the man raised up, up on high, the anointed of the God of Jacob, and the sweet psalmist of Israel. Psalm, when you sing psalms, that means your heart, you, your heart, you, 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 you really love God in your heart, actually. You, you are pouring out your heart when you sing praises to Him. Okay? And God is so pleased. So let's sing hymns more. Let's sing praises to Him. Okay? Sometimes you can write on psalm of your own. God, thank you so much. Read the psalms, by the way. There are so many psalms praising the Lord. Let's turn to Psalm 108, 108, Psalm number uh, 108. Let me show you one, some example. And that's what you can do. You can, you can have your own psalm. Psalm number 108, verse 1 to 3. 
Let's read it together. O oh God, my heart is steadfast. I will sing and give praise even with my glory. Awake, lute and harp, I will awaken the dawn. I will praise you, O oh Lord, among the peoples, and I will sing praises to you among the nations. Right? We will sing praises among the people, among the nations. No matter what people say, we'll just praise God. Right? Awake, lute and harp. Use your musical instrument. By the way, uh, let's turn to Psalm number 92. Here, we'll sing one thing. Uh, Psalm number 92, verse 1 to 3. Uh, Psalm number 92, another Psalm. Right? Uh, let's read it together. Verse 1 to 3. It is good to give thanks to the Lord and to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your loving kindness in the morning and your faithfulness every night on an instrument of ten strings, on the lute, and on the harp, with a harmonious sound. You see in verse 3, on an instrument of ten strings. Guitar has six strings. Ten strings, instrument with ten strings is really difficult to play, by the way. So this instrument with the ten strings means we really practice, you know, spend time to practice it, and then uh, we put effort to sing to the Lord because the ten string instrument will will have beautiful sound for God to hear to me. So we, we in our psalms we thank God, we glorify God and then we praise God and that's how we glorify God. So let me just summarize, okay? In J Isaiah chapter six verse one to three we see seraphim, a special kind of angels, uh, there in the in front of the throne. And they covered their face with two wings. What does that mean? Humility, humbleness, lowliness, right? And then covering two feet. What does that mean? We have to cleanse ourselves to serve the Lord in our life. God uses clean vessel. Okay? And then they were flapping their wings continuously before the Lord. Why? They are ready to do, serve the Lord anytime. No? So that's what we have to learn. Also, they were singing praises to the Lord. And that's what we will do in heaven forever and ever. Learn these lessons from Seraphim. And let's serve the Lord more and more until Jesus comes again. While it is daytime. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you so much for giving us all these lessons we need for our Christian life. And because... We want to repay your love in our life. We want to serve you. And today, from the seraphim, we learned how to serve you in our life. Lord, thank you so much for these lessons. Lord, it is our wish that we want to really please you in our life. You know, we want you to be proud of us, saying that, oh, you are a good servant. So Lord, change our heart and cleanse us so that we can work more and more for the Lord until we are living in this world. Lord, there are many things should be done and there are so many people who are not born again and there should be more missionaries, there should be um, more faithful brothers and sisters who will go here and there to preach the gospel. So Lord, please use us so that we can glorify you and we can serve you in our life. And we want to say, Lord, we are unprofitable servant. We just did whatever is our duty. And all the glory will bring all the glory to you. And that is, will be our happiness. So Lord, thank you so much for this time and in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.